All right, peeps. So here we are. We're back. It's trucking on. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about um, uninformed searches, and then I think we'll have enough time to start talking about informed searches, uh, guided searches. Uh, certainly, we'll be able to get through the greedy um, search and uh, also a star search. Um, and uh, then we'll see, we'll see. I might have to come back and finish it with one more video. Um, but anyway, so let's, let's, let's continue on soldiering on. So um, we left off, we talked about depth first search or a, a depth limited, sorry, depth limited depth first search. Um, that's what we did in the previous, um, you know, at the end of the last video. And uh, so I want to continue by talking about an iterative deepening depth first search, right? So what this is trying to do is this particular search is trying to find um, the best depth limit, okay? The best depth limit. So you might not know ahead of time exactly what the best depth limit is, right? So with a depth limited search, you're, you know, you're trying to be more efficient uh, when searching for a solution by not searching through the entire tree per se, right? You just go so deep into the tree and then you just pull up, right? You pull out, um, you know, and uh, you can experiment with that, you know, based off of previous knowledge. But if you're not sure or if there's no, you haven't decided upon an ideal limit there, what you can do is you can modify your search to be this iterative deepening depth first search, okay? And so here's here's how it works, okay? It's, it's this one's gonna be easy because we saw in the previous search that you know you had to pass to the search um, some depth, okay? Some depth limit um, four, eight, twelve, ten, whatever, okay? So what you do here is you modify a little bit to where you are gonna be repetitively upping the limit, right? So you're gradually increasing that limit until you can find that, that optimal depth, right? Um, so you start at a depth limit of zero and then one and then two, right? So where, you know, zero is, you know, the, the just, just the root node, if you want to measure it that way. You know, you just start at the, with the root node of the tree and then if you found your solution, awesome. Otherwise, you increase the depth limit by one and then you do it again. Right, and then you increase the depth limit by two, and then you do it again. Okay, now <clears throat> if you keep doing that, eventually you will find um, a goal node if there is a goal to be found. Okay, and um, that means that the search is going to stop once you find the shallowest goal node. Right now, remember when searching for a goal, you could have a set of goals. Right? to where a set of goal states, to where there's more than one, which would mean there would be more than one goal node, right? So there might be additional goal nodes deeper in the tree, but the search will stop when you find the shallowest one, the one that's highest up in the, um, in the tree. And as you run searches, um, you know, you can keep track of, you know, the depths in which you found your goals, right? And so, you know, if you found uh, over a series, of, I don't know, say a hundred searches, that the average depth was five, right? Then, um, then you could start there in the future with your depth limited search, right? Um, or you can modify it to where you don't start at the root. You know, you start with a limit of of uh, five, for example, um, from then on out. Okay. Um, so what this is is it's basically a combination. It's a merging. It's a smushing together of the depth first search and the breadth first search. Okay, so, um, you know, we're gonna go through, I won't uh, go through, you know, and draw out a whole tree or anything. There's a figure here that I'll just walk you through um, because really the uh, pseudocode for this is easy, right? We already talked about the depth limited search. Well, how do you modify that, right? Well, you have a wrapper function which is just going to return whatever depth limited search returns. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, you see here that you've got this loop from zero to infinity. Well, you know, what's infinity? I mean, 
I mean, you could you could change that even. You could change it to 20, 50, 80, whatever. But this is just saying, hey, just keep going. Just keep going. So what you're doing is you're running the depth limited search over and over and over and over and over again. And um, that depth is going up by one every single time. First pass, it's at zero. Next pass, it's at one. Next pass, it's at two. Next pass, it's at three. Next pass, it's at four, um, et cetera. And so you're just calling the depth limited search, which we already looked at, and increasing that limit by one each time, okay? And uh, if the result doesn't equal cutoff, then you go ahead and you return the result, okay? Otherwise, you keep going, right? Um, <clears throat> you know, if you never, ever, ever find uh, the, uh, uh, a goal or your goal, right? Could be the case that um, you've searched the entire state space and there's nowhere else to go, right? And then that depth limited search is gonna tell you, well, failure, right? And so then, um, you know, it's gonna return failure and you're gonna return that up through your wrapper function, okay? So, um, yeah, I mean, it just continues going on, on and on and on and on and on. Okay. So that's kind of cool. So the, the nice thing about this is that you have, um, you know, the amount of memory that you need, the resources, it's more efficient than just running a full depth first search or a full breadth first search um, per se, because you're going to, you're not going to have to create a tree that represents the entire state space necessarily, right? Um, and so here's the big O overall for the memory requirements, big O of, um, B times D. So what is this? The branching factor times the depth. Okay. So, um, you know, this would be in the worst case scenario where, you know, you find your goal at the lowest possible depth, right? But if you've got multiple goal states, then chances are you're not going to need this much memory. Okay. Um, now it's going to be complete if the branching factor is finite so what that means is is that you know you will find a um you will find a solution if there's a solution to be found um when there's not going to be any kind of loopy path right to where you're not going to end up in a situation where um your branching factor could be infinitely huge remember what branching factor is that is um you know, how many child nodes you can spawn or you can generate. Um, so, so long as there's no infinite loops, right? Or there's no loopy path in your, in your, uh, state space, then it will be complete, right? Um, the, uh, the situation where you could have a loopy path, um, you might not, you won't be complete or you, the, 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 uh, the algorithm isn't complete because what happens with, because think about death first search, right? What happens if you're heading down a subtree, okay? And as you're heading down that subtree, you keep generating the same uh, state over and over and over again. You're just gonna continue making a duplicate of nodes higher up in the subtree over and over and over and over again. You see, you see what I'm saying? Hopefully you follow that. You know, because you could be generating state A, generate which generates states B, which generates state C. You're traversing down the search you know, once you get to C, you might generate state A again, which leads to B, which leads to C, which leads to A, which leads to B, which leads to C, right? So, you know, in that case, you're, not, you're never going to find uh, a solution, right? So it wouldn't be um, a complete algorithm then. It would be incomplete because it could be the case that you don't find what you're looking for. Um, but if that's not possible, well then yeah, it, it's going to be complete. You will find a solution if there's a solution to be found. Okay. Um, can you find an optimal solution? Well, yeah. I mean, if the path cost is a non-decreasing function, right? In other words, um, if the uh, path cost doesn't shrink as you know you move deeper and deeper and deeper into um, the uh, tree, right? If it's a fixed cost or if the uh, cost gets bigger and bigger as you're going down, um, then it doesn't matter where you find, um, where you find the solution. Okay. You're always going to find uh, an optimal solution if the cost doesn't get better and better and better as you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the tree.
Okay. So here's that figure I was talking about. So let me just walk you through this rather than draw something out completely from scratch. Um, so if your limit is equal to zero and then you're counting, you know, your depth levels starting at zero, like you would with indexes for um, an array, and this is level zero. So what's this saying? Okay, well, you expand your initial state, right? You're the node for your initial state, and then you examine it. And uh, is that the goal? No. Okay failure we didn't find what we're looking for so then we're going to repeat the process but now we've upped the limit to one so you know let's examine the goal node or the uh, excuse me the initial node the initial state node and then that's not the goal so then you expand your frontier right so you generate your two child nodes and um, examine both of those and if neither of those are your goal well then repeat increasing the limit up to two right and so, um, you know, you examined your initial state, generate the children, and then uh, for uh, node B here, you generate its children, examine uh, both of them, right? And if they're not, uh, you know, the goals, then you go back and you go back to the other child C, and then generate its child nodes, and then you examine both of them, right? And so, kind of see, you've got this depth limited search, but uh, and it's depth for a search, but you're not going past that limit, right? You're filling out those upper levels of the tree before you move to the next level. So in that way, it's kind of like a breadth for a search, right? You do everything, um, you know, almost level by level, not, not quite, right? Because if it was, um, you know, level by level, for example, on, uh, when you have a limit of three, if breadth for a search would, would say, well, let's look at this level, then this level, then the complete levels, right? It goes, it fills out every single level, searching every single node in that level. Um, so it's not completely like that. With a sufficient enough limit, okay, it kind of looks like it, but um, with limit three, you can see that, you know, you do go down to the bottom depth, you know, which is your limit before you backtrack, right? So you go all the way down to the very bottom, as you can see here. Whereas with breadth first search, we would have had to have come back and hit F and G, okay? Um, but it does fill out the entire tree down to your limit, right? And so in, so in that regard, it's kind of like breadth first search because you fill out the entire um, bottom level before you move on to the next level. So kind of the same, but different. Okay. All right. Um, so, you know, as you, as the uh, search progresses, eventually you will find if the goal exists, you will find it and you'll also know at what depth it is too. That's kind of a nice little side effect or, or side feature um, is the fact that the last limit that got set is the one that, um, you know, indicates the depth where you found the thing because you know, when you hit that limit, it's the lowest depth. That's, you know, that's where you're going to, it's at, at the deepest where you could have found the goal. All right, so let's go ahead and continue here. So let's talk about bidirectional search. And for bidirectional search, this is more of an idea, right? And the text doesn't go into it in, in too much. Well, I mean, it goes into it in enough detail to give you an idea of how this could work without necessarily going through, um, you know, and showing you a pseudocode figure and whatnot. Um, the idea here is to run... Um, two two directional searches not not a two directional search but a, a two directional searches so you start a search from the goal state and you also start a search from the start state okay and both of those searches are expanding outwards within the goal state and the hope right is that they meet each other in the middle, okay? We're gonna see a figure of this here in a second and we'll be able to you know, get an idea. We'll see a graph, you know, and we'll be able to get an idea of why this is nice. Um, so why, What's what does this buy us, okay? Well, two circles, two smaller circles, right? Can meet in the middle and that would be the overall nodes that have to be generated to create those circles would be smaller 
than if you had to generate one giant circle. Okay, that's the idea. We'll see a picture of this. So the two smaller circles are gonna require an overall depth that is going to be smaller than if you just had one. Okay, um, so that, that's the idea. The area of those circles is gonna be less. So um, adding, you know, if you think about big, big O, um, big O of B to the half D, you know, added twice is less than, you know, B raised to the D, right? So you're getting this additive um, action in the big O instead of having to do, you know, an exponential growth. So this is actually going to grow slower than this. And so you end up with an overall more efficient um, search, right? Because the total number of nodes is going to be smaller. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at the diagram. Okay. So in your state space, you know, you've got your start state represented by some goal or some node, and then you got your goal node, right? Represented, you know, that's, that stores the goal state. Now, um, if you take a look, right? the start node and the goal node as both of the searches are running independently of each other right the the graph is growing in each direction that it can okay now if there is a path that can connect the two they'll eventually meet in the middle here somewhere okay now to go from to find that path from start to goal the area that the search encompasses for each of these is smaller than if we only ran one search. Because if we had to run one search starting from the start node, right, it would have to, in order to find the goal, it would have to go from the start to the goal and the area of that circle would be much bigger. So what does that mean? That means all of the paths inside of this circle, this bigger circle that's centered on just start, but the one search, would be much longer and there'd be more nodes within that search that had to be generated. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense because what each one of these lines are representing are a path, right? And there's multiple nodes along each one of these paths. And so there'll be fewer paths, shorter paths, I should say, with fewer nodes if you've got two independent searches running at once as opposed to one giant search. Okay. So instead of have, how do you, how would you implement this? Okay. Talking at a high level, you know, think about it this conceptually, right? So you replace the goal test function that we've been talking about so far. And instead what you do is, is you have code that, um, is monitoring the frontiers of both searches. You can make it multi-threaded, right? On one thread, you've got the search that's starting from the start node. And then you've got on another thread, the search that is um, starting from the goal node and uh, their shared memory space, you know, could be their frontiers, right? And so then you could have a third thread that's uh, monitoring both frontiers at the same time. And so if ever you have um, states in nodes in both frontiers that are the same, bam, you found your solution, okay? Because if there's a state in the frontier for this search and a state for the frontier in this search that are the same, that would mean that they both generated nodes in their frontier that have the same state, right? And remember on the frontier, that's the furthest out node from um, the start node, you know, wherever, this, wherever the, uh, the uh, search originated. So just because one starts from the goal or one starts from start, it doesn't matter the the the, the uh, searches are generally the same um, so you just make that little modification you have um, something that's monitoring the frontiers and if you ever see a shared state then that would mean that there's some node in between here that they both have in common which would mean there's a path right that goes from the goal up to that node and then there's a path from the start that goes to that node and so that would mean that there's a complete path between the two. And you've expanded overall 
fewer nodes than if you had done one giant search. Okay. Um, another way to put it, I mean, if, if there is a path between the two, okay, um, and you only ran one search starting from start, right? Your entire search in every single direction in your state space would have to be at least as long if you found the goal as the path from start to goal, okay? So on that graph, it could flow out in every direction, okay? So two smaller searches are better than one big search. Okay, now it may not be optimal because depending on how you score the paths, right? There might be, you know, there might be a path that would flow, you know, maybe south from start, you know, and, and, and go connect to the south of both start and goal that has a cheaper cost, you know, depending on how you score you know, your paths or your, 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 uh, your, your edges, right? So that might be cheaper than just the shortest overall path in terms of nodes. Okay. Um, now you could also do, you know, if you knew ahead of time that there was going to be, um, certain paths that had a higher chance of success, um, or if there were certain, um, yeah, I mean, certain nodes that might, would likely lead you to a cheaper solution. Well, you could do a, a, a second shorter search just to check the um, the high probability paths first, right? Just run that really quick. If the um, efficiency savings or the cost savings in the path is such that it's worth the risk of running a preliminary search on those high value or high probability paths, well, then, okay, fine, fine you can do that. You know, you're trying to find a, a shortcut, you know, across this gap here without having to run the entire search. You could, you could modify it that way. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so you have to, I mean, the, you have to be able to traverse in both directions. Okay. So, you know, you'd have to modify the nodes to where it's more like a, a, uh, so we're looking for it's more like a doubly linked list okay um what we've looked at so far with our algorithms the um, child nodes have always kept a pointer to their uh, parent node right um and that was it but if you want to be able to implement this type of a uh, approach this type of strategy then you need to be able to traverse in both directions right um so you got to keep track of parent and child. And so here's an I here's another figure that gives you an idea of how this could progress, right? So you've got, you know, your two root nodes in the graph. Okay. So maybe this is the goal. Maybe this is the start, or maybe this is start. This is goal. Let me do it that way. Maybe this is start. And maybe this is the goal. You start your search. Um, at both searches at the same time for both places. And so what these numbers are saying is, okay, here's the, here's the uh, order in which the nodes are generated. So in this search, you go from the very first node to the nodes label two, and then to the nodes label three, okay? So you're going in every single direction here. Similarly over here, right? One to two to three. Now the hope is, is that at some point you got a connection Right, so either this node or both of these nodes, you know, would be part of the frontier in both searches. And so at that point, you know that you've got a path. And so the thing is though, is that to be able to trace through or to be able to put together the solution, right, that set of actions, you have to be able to traverse all the way, right? Remember the solution function, you know, and the, so the way the solution function we originally looked at worked was that you'd start at the goal node and then work your way back up to the root. Okay. Well, that might work for just one solution, but where's the goal node, right? Remember, we don't have a goal test function. What we have is we have a test in the frontier and we go, okay, well, um, cool. Um, this node right here is in the frontier of both searches. So which way do you backtrack? If you backtrack this way, 
well then your solution ends here but it didn't it wasn't complete right you left out this part of the path okay so you gotta be able to traverse in both directions so that solution function would have to be able to go you know from um you know the common node the frontier to the start node and then from the common uh, node the frontier to um the goal node okay all right so here's a table that summarizes the performance of um of these uh different algorithms okay and um you know, it's an open book test, you know, and, you know, all your exams will be open books. So I may ask you for the exact numbers here. Uh, if these were normal times, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. I would just say, hey, which one's more efficient based off of this? You know, um, is this an optimal solution? I would ask you general questions like that. I wouldn't say, hey, what's the big O of depth first search, right? Because you can look that up. That's, that's, that's just something that you can, you know, I memorize that when you can look that up. Um, but, you know, Generally speaking, um, is depth first search complete? Um, no, because you could get stuck in that situation, as I was describing just a few minutes ago, where you're going down a subtree and it keeps repeatedly generating the same states over and over and over again. So you never um, find a solution. Um, but anyway, so, you know, what you have is, you know, is it complete? Um, breath first search is yeah i mean because remember you're keeping tra with a breath first search you're keeping track of you know where you've been and what you've seen right um and so uh what do i want to say about what else do i want to say about this um you know if 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 the branching factor is finite okay um and so you know you're keeping track of where you've been and you know if there's only so many nodes that you can generate eventually you will hit the bottom of the tree okay and um you know so it's gonna be complete uh is depth limited search complete well no because you know the uh solution might be at a depth that's lower than um, what your limit is is iterative deepening uh yeah again if the branching factor is finite right because it's behaves like breath first search you just keep going down um, level by level by level by level by level uh, and so forth right so I'll let you go ahead and review um, this table and the table just summarizes what we've already talked about right I talked about um, you know the performance in time and space uh, for bi-directional we just talked about that right the whole idea being you know um, what is the benefit of that, right? I mean, we were saying that the two half circles, um, you know, are better than the one big circle. So another way of looking at that, in case that's still a little confusing, is that, you know, B right here, this is representing the branching factor. D is the depth. So two searches are going to have to go half as deep into the tree <clears throat> than just a single search would. Right. If you're think about a, 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 a normal tree, right? The goal nodes down here in the root in the uh, in the start nodes up here, the initial states up here. OK, if you were doing a regular old search, you'd have to go all the way down. Right. You'd have to expand the entire tree to get down to that goal. OK, but if you're doing bidirectional, then the first search only has to go down to here. And then the, the second search at the goal only has to go up to here. So both of these searches potentially cover less space, okay? Less ground, they have to generate fewer nodes. Uh, okay, um, yeah, so I think that's everything I wanted to talk about with that. So I think now we can move on to uh, informed heuristic search strategies. So if you have any questions about that, give me a holler. You know, as I've said before, it's kind of hard to tell how well I described, um, you know, the, uh, the content there without having immediate feedback from you so hopefully you get a good feel for it and hopefully you know you've been reading through the slides and i just filled in some gaps for you okay and um, remember too that what i'm doing is i'm encouraging you to use these slides as a filter as a bitmap right take a look at these first um, read through them if it makes sense great if it doesn't hop on watch me talk about them 
Um, if it still doesn't make sense, then, then go to the text. Okay, I'm trying to save you from having to go into a deep dive in the textbook because it's there's there's a lot more there than we need. Right? And it's written at a at a higher level than where where we're at, unless you're in grad school, right? It's more of a grad school textbook, more of a graduate level. All right, so let's talk about uh, section 3.5, informed heuristic search strategies, or informed informed search strategies, also known as heuristic search strategies. That's 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 what I should have said. Um, so what's what's an informed search strategy? Okay, so with um, with these types of algorithms, essentially we're going to add a additional function that is going to be able to evaluate um, subsequent states or successor states, okay? And based off of the choice that the, or based off of the value that the evaluation function gives us, that's going to determine which node we choose to generate children for, okay? Or to, to generate successor nodes for, to expand, right? So um, we're using information um, about the problem uh, that is outside of or is that supplemental that is supplemental to the the problem definition itself so uh, you know we have all those pieces that we had before um, which was to say you know the initial state the um, goal test function the actions function the result function so we got all of that okay but um, and you know the combination of those things with you know, define the transition model, define how the state space is going to be formed, and all of that, just like before. But now we're going to add an additional function, call it an evaluation function, call it f of n, that is going to um, evaluate potential successor nodes and tell us whether or not, like I said, we should expand the node and create child nodes from it. Um, so basically that's going to allow us to direct our search. It's not going to be as methodical or mechanical as the uninformed search strategies were because the, with the uninformed search strategies, what you have, breath for search, death for search, you know, the uh, uniform cost search, uh, where it's just uh, the, the frontier is uh, a first in, first out queue, or it's last in, first out queue stack or a priority queue, and it just progresses automatically, right? Without there being an evaluation of which node really should go next, okay? Um, so with these informed searches, right, we're gonna add this, this evaluation function, which is gonna say, no, 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 I, no, we're not gonna just follow that pre-built order. You know, this node right here has the best chance of leading us where we wanna go in the most efficient way. Or this this node gives us the best chance of finding the most efficient path, okay? And so the evaluation function call of f of n um, is what we're going to use to to help us make that decision. And so you would feed to this thing a node that contains a state, and you'd say, okay, well, what's the what's the cost of this, right? Um, and it's going to give us a cost uh, estimate. So whichever node you have that's in your frontier that has the lowest cost based off of this evaluation function that's the one you're going to look at next that's the one you're going to look at next that's the one that you're going to generate children for next and that's the node through which your search is going to continue at this time right you're, you're, it's going to flow through your, your your search is going to continue on through that node next okay so this is very similar. You, know, you could go grab the code and the uh, pseudocode from the uniform cost search, and you'll see the previous video that I did. Implement it the exact same way, except instead of having that G function, right? The, the, the G function that's part of the uniform cost search, which is just you know managing the priority queue basically, um, you use this evaluation function instead. And it's going to be coded slightly different, okay, based on our needs here. Okay, so how you write this evaluation function is going to determine how the search progresses, okay? And there's a couple different flavors for the search, right? Now, most of the best first algorithms, they're a form of greedy algorithm, greedy search algorithm, 
use what's known as a heuristic function to help them uh, evaluate the next move, right? And the, the progression of the, of the search. So textbook refers to this as H of N and the evaluation function depends on this heuristic function, right? And, um, you know, heuristic means a guess, a good educated guess, and it's going to have information um, that is, like I said, supplemental to, you know, the problem that we've already defined. And we'll, we'll walk through an example. So it gets called by your evaluation function. Now, <clears throat> the uh, heuristic function, it's trying to give you a guess, an estimate right of um of the cheapest path from that state at the node that you or that the node that you fed to it contains to your goal state okay so you know if if i'm trying to make a sandwich downstairs okay um you know what are some actions i'm upstairs right now so what are some actions that i could take I could stand up, I could take a step left, I could take a step back, right? Each one of those actions, maybe I value those at one, okay? That's my path cost to, to stand up is one, to take a step left is one. Okay, now my heuristic function, if my goal is to make a sandwich well, or get my sandwich, my sandwich is the refrigerator downstairs. So my heuristic function would tell me, all right, well, um, the distance between where you're at right now in a straight line to the to the refrigerator is, I don't know, seven units or whatever, right? So whatever state I'm in, whether it's sitting here or um, standing to my left, you know, there's a cost that it's gonna, that I don't have to pay to get from that position to my refrigerator. Now, if I'm standing to my left, that cost is gonna be higher than if I'm standing right here, if, if I'm measuring it in a straight line, okay? Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. But for right now, consider this, right? If my goal was to be sitting in this chair, okay? And what would be the shortest path for me to be sitting in this chair? Well, I'm here now. I'm already here. So what would it cost for me to get here? What would be the shortest, least amount of cost I'd have to pay to get here? Well, it costs nothing. I'm already here. There is no estimated shortest path for me to get from here to here because I'm here. So if the node that you're evaluating is the goal node, well then this, this your heuristic function is gonna give you zero. So that gives you kind of a baseline to work off of. Okay, so uh, here's an example that we'll, that we'll, that we'll go through. And um, you know, call this the greedy best first search. So what this is doing is every time there's a node that you need to generate children for, okay, this particular approach always tries to generate children for a node that is closest to the goal, according to your heuristic function, okay? So um, in this case, essentially, the evaluation function is the heuristic function. That's all it is. So you're deciding which node to proceed with your search based purely off of this heuristic, okay? So example, call it the uh, straight line distance heuristic, okay? And uh, so this evaluation function is just straight up returning what the heuristic function would return, okay? So um, we're gonna go through this example. We're gonna try to find a path from, you know, we're going back, we're going back to Czechoslovakia from ARAD to Bucharest, okay? And uh, our algorithm is gonna depend upon this evaluation function to choose which city to visit next, okay? Um, so this is all of the information that is outside of everything else that we've talked about, right? This is, this is information that we have in addition to, it's a supplemental information. We had the actions we could take, we had the results function, we had the action function, we had the initial state function, we had the goal test function, right? Um, but now, in addition to that, we build this heuristic function. That heuristic function provides this information here. So if you feed to it a state, 
it returns some cost. So in this case, here's all the states that make up our state space. Each one of those states represents a city. Okay, so ARAD. So the uh, heuristic function, if I fed it the state of ARAD, would spit out 366. Right? Because that's the straight distance as the crow flies from ARAD to Bucharest, right? If you could fly straight there in an airplane, right? Or, or whatever, in a kite, fly a kite straight there, be a bird, be 366 units, call it miles, call it kilometers, whatever. Okay, but if you're already in Bucharest, if you're already at the goal, right? You wanna get there, you're there, well, how far do you have to travel in a straight line to get from where you are to where you are? Well, zero, right? That's what we're talking about, you're your goal state. Right, your goal node. Okay, so for each state, there's a cost to get from that state in a straight line to your goal. Okay, so this is our heuristic, our straight line distance heuristic. Okay, so here's our initial state. Okay, that's our first node added to our search. And so we have to then um, expand that, placing additional nodes in the frontier. And then we have to decide, okay, uh, well, which node do we then proceed to, you know, and then, exp and then, uh, you know, create its child nodes and throw them into a frontier. Well, uh, we would feed each one of these nodes into our heuristic function. The heuristic function would examine the state, you know, look up, do a little look up on its table and say, oh, well, here's Subaru. Uh, there's a cost of 253. Right, so if you go to Subaru, to go in a straight line from Subaru to Bucharest is going to cost you 253. Then we look at Tiramisu in the frontier, feed that to the heuristic function. It's going to tell us, well, that's 329. Going to feed uh, Zebraland here, and um, that's going to tell us 374. Okay, so guess which node we proceed to. Right, according to our heuristic, we're not going to. You know, just automatically pick with the depth of research, we would just automatically pick Subaru, right? Or um, you know, whichever one was added to the to the to the um, frontier last, right? If it was breadth for search, we just pick the one that was added first. Well, we're not doing that anymore. We're evaluating the cost according to this heuristic, and so in this case, it just so happens to be that the leftmost node is the cheapest. Okay. You know, so if this was a frontier and we expanded that, then expanded that, expanded that, then this would be the first one. So it's just coincidence that it's at the very beginning. But okay, so that has the lowest heuristic cost. So that's the one that we're going to expand, that we're going to create its child nodes for and add to the frontier. So here's all the values. Here's all the nodes in the frontier. So we're going to prune these subtrees right here. We're not going to, we're never going to look at their child nodes. Right, because we're we've we've guided the search down here according to the heuristic function. All right, so we go through the frontier, feed each one of these nodes into the heuristic function, and um, similar thing happens. Right, it it does a look up on its table and spits out the value for each one of these things. So our ARAD has a cost of three sixty six according to the table. Um, Fagundas has one hundred seventy six. Orinda three eighty. Rincon Valley one hundred ninety three. So guess which one we're gonna go with? We're gonna go with um, Fagundas here. So with Fagundas, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and expand its frontier, or expand its children, you know, create its children, and um, add those to our frontier, right? And so, what are the two nodes in that frontier um, for Fagundas? Subaru and Bucharest feed both those nodes into our, into our evaluation function, which is basically just feeding them the heuristic function for this, for this example. So Subaru has a value of 253, Bucharest has a value of zero. Boom, done. Right, we found our goal. This is past our goal test and uh, its value is zero, so that's the one we're gonna choose. And so now what's the solution? Feed Bucharest into the solution function and then follow the pointers, boom, boom, boom. So our solution is travel from ARAD to Take the action of traveling from Arad to Subaru, and then from Subaru to Fagundas, then from Fagundas to Bucharest. Okay. All right. So here's some notes for you. It's minimal. Um, why? Because according to, by using our heuristic function here as our evaluation function, the only nodes that get expanded, in other words, the only nodes 
who have child nodes generated are those nodes that are along the path, right? So we pruned off this subtree here. We pruned off this subtree here. We pruned off a subtree here. We pruned off subtree here. So we have a minimal number of nodes that had to get generated from the state space, right? We didn't have to generate every single node for every possible state, okay? Um, but it's not optimal as it turns out, you know, there's a path that would have a total cost that was less, right? So going from ARAD to Subaru to Fagundas to Bucharest is actually a total cost um, more than if you went from ARAD to Subaru to Rincon Valley to Pittsburgh to Bucharest, right? So if you measure the distance between this, these two cities and then between these two cities and between these two cities and between these two cities, it would actually be 32 kilometers shorter, right? So that's an issue. Right, um, with this particular approach. So we're gonna look at another version of this here in a second that, that deals with that or tries to deal with that. Okay, um, that's an improvement. So this is referred to as greedy, why? Because it only looks at the immediate next step. It only looks, it doesn't look past, um, you know, four nodes ahead. It's only looking at the immediate frontier, okay? Uh, incomplete, it can generate infinite loops. So, you know, if, if you generate infinite loops, then the search can be looping. <laughs> that's what an infinite loop means, right? So if that's the case, you get trapped in that loop, then you never have a chance to expand your goal node. And if you can't, or to uh, create your goal node or examine your goal node. So if you can't examine your goal node, then you can never identify the goal. And so the search never ends. Um, and so you never find a solution. So, for example, you know, I'll leave it to you to do, but, you know, try to find a solution and travel, for, try to find a path between Lazi and uh, Bagaras here. You're going to see that you can continuously, the algorithm will follow in a loop. Okay. Um, now, if you go with the graph search version, right, remember the difference between the tree version and the graph version. The tree version didn't keep track of where you know, the, the, the states that you've seen before, right? The graph version does. So if you keep track of states that have been generated, um, you know, it will actually be complete because you, you, you avoid the loop, right? For reasons we've covered before. All right, so uh, what's your worst case time and space complexity? Um, you know, just on infinite spaces, I mean, that should be, that should be obvious on its face, right? I mean, if, if your state space is infinite, if you have an infinite number of cities that you can visit, then you might not ever make it to, you know, um, your goal city. It, may, it might be infinite nodes away. Um, or if, or if you're always adding cities, building new cities into the state space, um, as you're doing your search. Uh, worst times, the worst case time and space complexity, big O of B times M for maximum depth of M. So, you know, your branching factor raised to the power of your depth, right? So remember branching factors, how many children you can have, depth is how uh, far you can possibly go. Now you can um, improve this performance. The better quality heuristic function is, um, the better performance you're going to have. Okay, so, um, you know, a better heuristic function, better tailored, making better guesses will lead you to shorter and more efficient paths. Okay. And I mean, the whole classes can be taught on how to construct your heuristic function. So um, that's all I'll say about that. All right. So next up, we're going to talk about the uh, A star search. Okay. And the A star search, uh, which is probably the, the, the best known, uh, the most famous of these best first searches, um, combines the two types of uh, functions. Um, into its evaluation function. So the cost, the path cost, G of N, plus the heuristic cost gets combined. So that G of N function from your uniform um, search, your uniform cost search, right, which is basically just you know, processing a priority queue. You're, we're going back and grabbing that and the heuristic functions. So what that means is that our evaluation function is going to try to give us the best guess at, at the cost for the best solution 
through that node that the evaluation function is um, is evaluating, right? That it's that it's being passed, right? So, what we're trying to do, that we're trying to guide the search through nodes that have the lowest sum of those two values, both the immediate path cost to travel from a rad to an adjacent city, plus the cost of that adjacent city going straight to Bucharest, right? Now, if you've got a good heuristic function, assuming that it's optimal, assuming that's the best, then an ACER a star search is going to be both complete and optimal because it will it will find the solution for you every time um, and it's going to be the cheapest solution so the code for this the pseudo code for it recycle that uniform cost search and replace that g of n function with an f of it, with an f and n function where it's returning the cost of gnn and um, the heuristic function combined. So you're not just going off of that immediate path cost anymore, choosing the node from the frontier with the lowest cost. You're choosing the node from the frontier in the uniform cost search algorithm that has the best immediate cost plus heuristic, fun heuristic function cost. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so that's why I'm not reproducing that code here because we've seen it before uh, in the previous video. Okay, so it's just, you're not just doing G of N, you're doing the total of that G of N plus your heuristic. Okay, so here's an example, and we're going to trace through this here. All right, so here we go. Um, let's walk through it. So here's the uh, table for the uh, straight line distances that the heuristic function is using. And uh, now, remember, we're combining... Um, the cost of traveling from you know one city to an adjacent city plus the heuristic function. So the G of N is the cost of traveling from say A red to Subaru, right? So you got that plus the heuristic function cost, which we already talked about. So let's just let's just dig through this a little bit. So here's our initial state. Okay, so what's its total cost? Well, its evaluation function is going to tell us that its cost is 366. Why? Well you've got the cost of zero to travel to yourself, right? Um, plus the cost of the heuristic function, right? That's 366 because ARAD 366. Okay, fine. So you then run the actions function on the ARAD state and it tells you here's all the actions you can take. Go to Subaru, go to Tiramisu, go to Zebra, right? And then uh, you feed ARAD plus each of those actions in turn to your result function. Create your child nodes, Subaru, Tiramisu, um, zebra, those go into the frontier for ARAD. And then at that point, you have to decide, okay, well, who do we go to next? Where does the search proceed from here? Okay, so if you look at Subaru and feed that into the evaluation function, well, that's going to return a score of 393. Um, why? Well, because um, to go from ARAD to Subaru is 140 plus the heuristic function 253. If you look at the chart, Subaru, right, Subaru 253. Um, cost, the total cost for the, that the evaluation function re reports for Tiramisu is 447 because 329 from the heuristic and then 118 um, from the GN function to travel from ARED to Tiramisu. That's the path cost for that one action. And then Zebraland's 449 because 75 is the cost of, that's path cost for right there, that's GMN. Plus 374, which is the heuristic function, right? There's Zebra Land, 374. So which one are we going to proceed to? Or where's the search going to go to next? It's going to go to Subaru. It's got the lowest cost. Okay, now um, from here, we've got uh, four possible nodes in the frontier. Okay, and so what are their costs going to be? The Will evaluation function for similar reasons as I laid out uh, up to this point. ARAD's got 646. Um, Vargas has got 415, or Rinda's got 671, Rincon Valley's got 413. So, you know, which one is overall cheapest? Well, the cheapest is Rincon Valley, 413. So that's where the search proceeds from there, right? And so Rincon Valley, we expand that node, 
creating these three child notes, which end up in its frontier. We evaluate, pass them through the evaluation function. Uh, Concord here has a F of N value of 526. Remember F of N is the evaluation function, which is in turn calling the path class function, which is G of N, and then also calling the heuristic function, which is H of N. So its path class function re reports 366. It's uh, heuristic 160 for total 526. Pittsburgh, same thing, but 417. Subaru, 553. Okay, now, before moving on, Let's take a look here, right? Let's see what we got. Okay, so the cost of Fargaros, right? Total cost for that was 415. Now look over here. Okay, what is um, the cost here? Okay, the cheapest here is 417. Right now, remember with uniform cost surge, we were able to kind of backtrack because of the priority queue, right? So you do have backtracking action here too, because Fargaros is actually cheaper than Pittsburgh, right? So we would actually go back and expand Fargaros, right? And we'd look at that and go, okay, well, there's 591 and then there's 450, okay? And so the Q action takes over again and says, okay, well then, um, you know, what's my cheapest alternative now? Well, where are we going to go? We're going to go back over to Pittsburgh because look at the overall evaluation functions. I mean, yeah, Bucharest is right here, but you're driven by these values as to where you're the the um, the uh, search is going to go next, how it's going to proceed. So remember, you're driven by that evaluation function, not necessarily like, oh, there's Bucharest, because that might not be the shortest path. Right? Matter of fact, the cost to get there, according to our uh, valuation functions, 450, the cost to get over to Pittsburgh is 417. Right? So guess who we're going to expand next? Right? We're going to go and we're going to do um, Pittsburgh. Okay? And so Pittsburgh gets expanded. <laughs> These three nodes get added to the um, frontier and uh to our queue and uh so we got bucharest we got Concord, we got rincon valley so look, let's look at the costs here so what's the cheapest bucharest 418 and so that's going to be our goal that's where the, the that's where the search is going to proceed and so then we grab that node feed that node into our goal test evaluates to true and we've got our solution so that gave us an optimal solution because look at the total cost here. It's 418. What was the cost over here? 450, right? So we got the cheaper overall path cost. Now, um, or the cheapest overall cost, right? So with a value of 418, our solution is, um, go from, uh, you know, we'd, we'd put Bucharest back into our, in, into our, this, this instance of Bucharest into our, a solution function, even though we generated two different goal nodes, this is the one where our search ended. So it would follow the pointers back up, and the solution that would be returned would be the sequence of actions, uh, go from ARAD to Subaru, from Subaru to Rincon Valley, from Rincon Valley to Pittsburgh, and then from Pittsburgh to Bucharest. That would be your solution for this. Okay. Uh, let's see. Got a couple more things to do here. Um, I think that I'll go. I mean, I think this video has ran for about 45 minutes. Uh, yeah. Okay. One, one more, one more slide and then we'll come back and we'll finish this off in one more video and we'll be done with the, with the chapter. Okay. So what about a memory bounded heuristic search? Okay, so this tries to um, deal with memory. Okay, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize memory even more. Okay, you're always trying to squeeze out one last piece of, uh, you know, every last bit of performance, every last bit of resource you can. You're trying to save as much as you, as you possibly can all the time when doing anything with computer science, right? So here's one approach. Okay, there's a couple of different approaches here. One approach is to use iterative deepening a star search so 
remember when we were talking about iterative deepening search, right? And when we were talking about that uh, depth, we were combining the depth limited search um, with uh, repetition, where the depth was just incre increasing by one each time. Well, you can do a similar thing here with a star search. It's just that instead of using um, the depth number like we used with the um, iterative depth, you know, the, the repeating depth for search or depth limited search, excuse me, um, we're going to use that function cost instead of the depth. Okay. Okay. Uh, so there's another approach here, and that is to use recursion. And so what we do is we come up with a recursive best first search. And so this tries to do that um, standard best first search, which we talked about, um, but tries to do it using space that's linear, okay? That has a complexity that's linear. So this is where we'll come back um, next time, okay? We'll pick up here and then we will go through how this algorithm works uh, in general, I'll trace through this tree with you a little bit, and then, uh, then we'll be done with the chapter. Um, is there anything else that I need to include with the, no, I think we're going to be done at that point. Um, I might do, I might give you another bit of sample code, a little bit, uh, more help in that regard, maybe a little snippet to show you how to, you know, generate code on the, or, uh, nodes on the fly. Um, but maybe not, we'll see how long the next, the, the last video takes. All right, anyway, that's it for tonight, and uh, we'll see you next time.